this is when we finish this tonight we will have gone through the books of poetry and now we will turn our sights on the prophets so I'm just going to tell you where we're going here just so you you know uh, uh, next Sunday Lord willing we will introduce the prophets there's major prophets and there's minor prophets we'll talk about that when we're in the middle of that we won't get through the prophets we're going to hit the last Sunday of September by the way uh, Labor Day Sunday weekend uh, that night we will not meet that night Labor Day Sunday evening so that's the third of September I believe and then so we'll pick up on the on the 10th 17th and the 24th of September we will shift gears for just a little over a month and we're going to show in the evening time uh, some videos related to the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century specifically on the five solas of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, sola Scriptura, Scripture alone, uh, Sola Gratia, uh, Grace alone, Sola Fide, Faith alone, Solo Christo in Christ alone, Soli Deo, Glory to the glory of God alone. And what we'll do is we'll show those on Sunday night and then the following Sunday morning for a whole month of October, five Sundays in October, we will preach through the five solas. And so we're going to take a break from 1 Corinthians on Sunday morning, take a break uh, from the uh, seeing Jesus in all the scripture on Sunday night and do a segment to celebrate because October 31st, 2017 will be the 500th anniversary of the launching of the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century, which is impacts, it's part of the reason we're, we're who we are today. Okay? So that's where we're going. I just want to give you a, a Notice of that. Song of Solomon, we're looking at, uh, at chapter 7, verse 10, chapter 8, verse 7. Stand with me if you would as we think tonight about the joys of divinely prescribed love. 710. I am my beloved's, and his desire is for me. Then chapter 8, verse 7. Many waters cannot quench love. Neither can floods drown it. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. An interesting way of saying that if you, if you assigned a value to love and thought you could make a trade, then people would despise you because you have way undervalued love. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And we want to, uh, I think in a study like this, we're not going to get graphic. I hope you know that about me. But in a study like this, it, it, we need to celebrate married love. That had not always been the position of the church. Our friends, the Puritans, put a real kibosh on some of these things. And we'll talk about that a little more as we get going. Thank you. Please be seated. All right. Song of Solomon. I want to, uh, before we launch into the video, I want to read... It's not on your slides, but I want to read this as it's introduced. Chapter 1, verse 1, the song of songs, which is Solomon's. We'll talk about this later in the, in the title. Remember, Solomon wrote, well, 1,005 songs were told in our, in our previous studies. And this one is titled, the, the Song of All of His Songs. A song greater than any of it. In fact, it's called the greatest song in some places. We give the designation. Our, our Bible project video we're about to watch talks about the Song of Songs. They use that description. We talk about the Song of Solomon to identify an author. But when we're looking through this tonight, remember he wrote a lot of songs. This is considered his greatest hit. Okay? Let's watch the, uh, the video. The Song of Songs. It's a well-known but not so well-understood book of the Bible. It's eight chapters of love poetry. And while there is an introduction and a conclusion, the book doesn't have any kind of rigid literary design, and that's because it's a collection of poems. They're not meant to be dissected or taken apart. They're meant to be read as a flowing whole and simply enjoyed. 
The first line of the book tells us that it's the Song of Songs, which is a Hebrew idiom like the Holy of Holies or the King of Kings. It's a Hebrew way of saying the greatest thing. So this is the greatest song of all songs. Then we're told in the first line that this Song of Songs is of Solomon, which could mean that he is the author. His name does begin the book after all. But as you read the poems, you discover that the main voice is that of a woman called the Beloved. And while there is also a male voice, it does not seem to be Solomon's. Solomon is mentioned a couple times in the poems, but he's never a speaker. And you do have to admit, Solomon is a very odd candidate as the author of this book, given the fact that he had 700 wives. For the lovers in the Song of Songs, they are the only ones in the world for each other. So the of Solomon likely means in the wisdom tradition of Solomon. He was known for his wisdom, his poetry, his love of learning about about every part of life, and Solomon became the father of wisdom literature in Israel. And so his legacy is here carried on through a collection of love poems that explores the human experience of love and sexual desire. The opening poem introduces us to the basic theme of this book. We hear the voice of the young woman who delights in her man, a shepherd. Now she's not married to him yet, but it becomes clear that they're engaged and they cannot wait to be together. From the introduction, the poems flow back and forth from the woman's voice to the man's, shifting from scene to scene without any kind of clear linear sequence or storyline. The poems move in these symphonic cycles and key images and ideas get repeated and developed. So one of the basic themes uniting the poems is the intense desire that this couple has for each other expressed through their constant seeking and finding. So after the opening poem, they're separated but on the hunt for one another. So the woman calls out or she'll wake up from a dream or go looking for her lover and more than once they'll find each other, they'll embrace and then right when things start to get a bit racy the scene will suddenly end and a new one will start, they're separated looking for each other and on it goes. Another repeated theme is the joy of the couple's physical attraction for one another. So multiple times they'll pause and describe each other with these elaborate metaphors. And here it's very helpful to know that these images and metaphors in Hebrew poetry are not primarily visual. If you try and paint a picture of these people based on the metaphors, you will end up with something that looks very, very strange. What you're supposed to do is reflect on the meaning of these images as they relate to the man and the woman. So you'll read through the poetic cycles and the tension will keep building and their desire and joy and attraction. And this spiraling repetition is a poetic way of heightening and focusing on the mystery and power of sexual love. It all comes together in the conclusion, which pauses to summarize what these poems are all about. Love is as strong as death. Its passions are as severe as the grave. Its flashes are of fire, a divine flame. Many waters cannot extinguish love. Rivers cannot sweep it away. If one were to give all the wealth of one's house for love, he would be utterly scorned. The poem highlights the power and the intensity of love, how it's both beautiful but also dangerous. Like fire, love can destroy people if it's abused or be life-giving if it's protected. Ultimately, love expresses the insatiable human longing to know and be fully known and desired by another. Love is one of the most transcendent and mysterious experiences in human life, and as a part of the Bible's wisdom tradition, this book says it's a gift from God. After this, there's an odd poem about Solomon trying to do what the previous poem just said was impossible, to buy love. The woman rejects Solomon's offer, and then the book concludes with the man and the woman. They're separate once more on the hunt for each other. He calls to hear her voice. She begs him to run away with her, and that's how the book ends. Just totally open-ended. But that's a lot like love which never truly concludes because there's always more to discover and pursue in your beloved. And so true love has no end and neither does this book. Now through history, the big question raised by the Song of Songs is what on earth is love poetry doing in the Bible? There have been three main interpretations of this book throughout history. In Jewish tradition, it's been read as an allegory, each character a symbol. So the woman is Israel, the man is God, and their love is a symbol of the covenant between God and Israel made at Mount Sinai and the giving of the Torah. This view flowed into the Christian tradition, but the characters were swapped. So it's about Christ's love for his people, 
the church. And this interpretation was inspired by Paul's words in Ephesians 5, that a Christian husband's love for his wife is a symbol of Christ's love for the church. What's interesting is that in the last hundred years, archaeological discoveries among Israel's ancient neighbors in Egypt and Babylon has turned up all kinds of ancient love poetry that's very similar in language and imagery to the Song of Songs. We see that love poetry was a meaningful part of Israel's cultural environment, which has led most scholars today to view the Song of Songs as what it presents itself to be, an arrangement of Israelite love poetry reflecting on the divine gift of love. But that doesn't mean that it's only ancient love poetry. There's a key feature of these poems that sticks out when you read them as a part of the Old Testament, and that's the overwhelming use of garden imagery. There are powerful echoes of the Garden of Eden and the idyllic scene between the married couple in the early chapters of Genesis. So the image of the man and the woman naked and vulnerable, but completely unified and safe with one another. This resonates in the background of the Song of Songs. It's as if in these poems we are witnessing the love of a couple whose relationship is untainted by selfishness and sin. And so ultimately the song holds out hope that even though our own relationships are so often distorted by selfishness, love is a transcendent gift and it's meant to point us to something greater, to the gift of God's love that will one day permeate and transform his beloved world. And that's what the Song of Songs is all about. All right, it's a good, uh, very good summary. Uh, we won't necessarily come down exactly where the uh, where that teacher does in terms of the authorship, but it is one of the one of the views uh, of authorship. Uh, we believe it's written by Solomon, and we'll show you when we get to that portion several places in the book itself which assert, uh, which identify uh, Solomon. Um, it, this is one of those challenges and where you see this uh, in the gospel sometime you see this in some of the, the prophets where you have historical truth taught to stand on its own and then what would be called allegorical application from that and I think this is what Paul's getting at in Ephesians 5 this when he talks about how a husband should love his wife as Christ loved the church and and the, the wife should submit to her husband as unto the Lord and back and forth and the, the husband uh, should love his wife and the wife should respect her husband and he finally says this is a mystery but I'm speaking of Christ in the church in other words is is all that marriage means is that a husband is to show what Christ's love looks like and a wife is to show what submission to Christ looks like no but does a marriage mean that yes at, at its best marriage at its best manifests that and exemplifies that imperfectly albeit so in this, uh, in this book, uh, there's uh, a lot of metaphors, a lot of oriental imagery. Uh, it's the wooing and the wedding of a shepherdess by King Solomon uh, and the joys and heartaches of wedded love. It depicts, as has already been said in the video, a uh, picture of Israel as God's uh, espoused bride. We'll see, a, we'll see a reference to that in a bit. Uh, and the church as the bride of Christ. It's been said that, a, that, that human life finds its highest fulfillment in the love of man and woman. That is not to say that a man living without a woman uh, doesn't have meaningful life. It's just saying the human life finds it. Jesus said, God said in the garden, it is not good for the man to be alone. It's a, it's a basic principle of, uh, of reality. And in that way, uh, spiritual life finds its highest fulfillment in the love of God for his people and Christ for his church. The, the book takes on this picture of these scenes, various scenes in a drama, and so it makes it uh, very challenging to outline, except just to say, okay, you have the, you have the uh, the, the Shulamite woman speaking here. You have uh, the beloved speaking here. The man. You have the chorus speaking here. These uh, these daughters of Jerusalem. Let me give you a quick snapshot. We're going to look at a, a, a kind of a picture of the uh, sort of a quick survey of it. It takes place in Israel over. Uh, span of about a year, 
uh, courtship into, into wedding. Uh, there is in this this beginning of love, chapter 1, 1 to chapter 5, 1. Within that, the idea of falling in love, this courtship and, and the cultivating, fostering love, then, the, then becoming united in love uh, in, in the latter part of that, the wedding, which becomes the fulfillment or the consummation of the beginning of the journey of love. Uh, then there's the broadening of love, chapter 5, verse 2 to chapter 8, verse 14, which uh, demonstrates itself in a struggling in love. Uh, and if you've been married any length of time at all, I mean, Karen and I have been together 43 years, then you, you know this roller coaster ride uh, that is called um, uh, marriage. Uh, you touch on all these things. Uh, you face problems, uh, frustrations that, are, that crop up in love. Then growing in love, uh, through, toward the end, chapter 7, toward the end of uh, the book, this, the faithfulness, how Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, he's talking about love. Love never ends, he says, or love never fails. And what he's saying there is that, this, that love, this, this, this biblically prescribed love, uh, keeps on loving. Granted, that's impossible when one person in the relationship is em embracing biblical love and another person in the relationship abandons biblical love. But when both both people are committed to biblical love. Brother Charlie, how long did you tell me that you and Norma Lee were married? Was it 60, 64 years? Nah. I'm just that old, so I can't pretend to tell you what that was like, but I can tell you what was, what was a key mixture in that, a mutual commitment to biblical love. Okay? Um, so let's think about a little more in a little more in depth what we've just gone over here. Solomon wrote a thousand and five songs according to 1 Kings 4:32, uh, and this is this is the song of songs. This is the penultimate. This is the the greatest song. Um, I mentioned already the metaphors and 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 Oriental imagery. It it speaks of the of the purity, the beauty, and the satisfaction of love. It doesn't get crass in its description, but it's very intimate. It explores the dimensions of the relationship between two lovers. Attraction, desire, companionship, pleasure, union, separation, faithfulness, and praise. Just like the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, it's not easily outlined. So, when we get into this section on the beginning of love, uh, look at Psalm uh, song of Solomon, or we're going to call it just, we may just say the song. Look at the song, chapter 6, verse 13. There's a vineyard in the country from which the Shulamite comes. And so we say in 6.13, return, return, O Shulamite, return, return, that we may look upon you. Why? Should you look upon the Shulamite as upon a dance before two armies? Strange language there. That, that's not going to communicate to us. It's not going to connect with us, a dance before two armies. But basically, life is challenging, sometimes violent around us, uh, and to be able to gaze upon the one we love uh, is like a dance in the midst of battle. Song of Solomon 8, 11. Song, Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Hamon, he let out the vineyard to keepers. Each one was to bring for its fruit a thousand pieces of silver. So you have this vineyard imagery. I think, I think the uh, fellow on the video called it a garden. Very reminiscent. If you remember, if you've been with us, tracking with us throughout the whole study, you saw the, the, the symbolism of a garden has popped up several times in these studies. The Shulamites got to work the, uh, the vineyard with her brothers. Look at uh, chapter 1, verse 6. Do not gaze at me because I'm dark because the sun has looked upon me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. Uh, this idea of, of caring, this is the kind of woman she is, and you know women like this, caring so much for others, keeper of the vineyards, uh, neglecting herself. My own vineyard I have not kept. Uh, and here's a woman of, of self-sacrifice. And so, The same passage, chapter 8, 11, and 12, look at verse 12. My vineyard, my very own, is before me. 
you, O Solomon, may have the thousand, and the keepers of the fruit, two hundred. And so you have this, this dialogue going on, uh, all, all talking about a vineyard, but it's talking about much more than a vineyard. It's talking about the deepening of relationship. Um, I'm not going to take the time. I, if you're interested and you want me to send you a, a uh, list of where, it's, it's sometimes difficult to know who's saying what, who's speaking in this thing. And so folks have taken a stab at it, and I found a, what I think is a pretty good one. And I can send you this list where it says, here's the bride talking, here's the groom talking, here's the chorus uh, responding. But let's look at the, uh, this idea of courtship in chapters 1, verse 3. There's five or six things I want to point out here. First of all, the bride's longing for affection uh, at the palace before the wedding. Let's, let's look at that here in chapter 1, verses 2 through, uh, through 8. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is oil poured out. In other words, when I, when I hear your name, it's like I'm being refreshed. Therefore, virgins love you. Draw me after you. Let us run. The king has brought me into his chambers. Now, this is, this is the woman speaking here. And then the others, the, the, the daughters respond, We will exult and rejoice in you. We will extol your love more than wine. Rightly do they love you. And she responds, I'm very dark, but lovely. O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar. Now here we get in these images that's going to escape us. The, the tents of Kedar mean nothing to us, right? <laughs> but in her context here, she is describing not so much charm as she is, uh, how can I say, the usefulness. Like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Do not gaze upon me because I'm dark, because the sun has looked upon me. My mother's sons, we read this earlier, my own vineyard I have not kept. Tell me you who, lo you who my soul loves, where you pasture your flock, where you make it lie down at noon. For why should I be like one who veils herself beside the flocks of your companions? And Solomon responds then, verse 8, If you do not know, O most beautiful among women, Follow in the tracks of the flock and pasture your young goats beside the shepherd's tent. Now, this is how you, uh, we, we, we learned a term, a phrase uh, this weekend. Shoo, shoo, it's where, you, where you're calling her sweetie, right? Or sherry, uh, where you, this, is how you, this is how you court your wife. This is how she courts you. And I just, I just challenge you to read over this and say, when's the last time you said your love is better than wine? Fill in, fill in the blank, whatever your, whatever your favorite drink is. Maybe your love is better than Mountain Dew. I don't know. Just what, what, but it, you know, when's the last time you spoke in those terms? Uh, your name is oil poured out. When, when, when is the last time you said, oh, you're, when I hear your voice, it's like oil poured out. Now, that's many women say that to their husband when they come in and they know that they can finally unload the children on them. You know, you're, it's very refreshing to hear your voice. So you have this, this picture. This, the second thing is these expressions of, of mutual love in the banquet hall. I'm not going to go through all of this with you. I want you to, to do some of this on your own. A springtime visit of the king to the bride's home in the country is captured in chapter 2, verse 8 to 17. Then the, then the Shulamite dream of separation from her beloved. I want to read this with you. Chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. She says, on my bed by night, I sought him whom my soul loves. Now, she's not looking for him in bed, all right? Just stay with us here. She's wakened. I sought him, but I found him not. I will rise now and go about the city in the streets and in the squares. I will seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but I found him not. The watchmen found me as they went about in the city. Have you seen him whom my soul loves? Scarcely had I passed them when I found him whom my soul loves. Notice, notice the refrain here, him whom my soul loves. That's a, that's a powerful picture here. In other words, I don't, I don't just love him, uh, what's a country song, 
I love the way you love me. I don't just, she doesn't just love him because of the way he loves her. Uh, he, she loves him in the depths of her soul. My soul loves this one. When that happens, by the way, it doesn't really matter what, what you end up looking like. I mean, believe me, I saw a picture this morning, Karen pasted it on Facebook, I think, yesterday, of Karen and myself at the, uh, at the wedding of our best friends. The, the, the man died recently of cancer. They were married in May, a month before we were married in June. So I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't dressed up in the tux. That's what, I mean, I was in a tux, but not my wedding tux. She wasn't in her wedding dress. We were just groom, groomsman and bridesmaid. I looked at that and I thought, wow, I have not aged very well. And, but, but she loves me. Her soul loves me. So she's able to look past the, the growing evidence of imperfections. Then there's this ornate wedding procession from the bride's home to Jerusalem in chapter 3, verses 6 to 11. He, uh, Solomon praises his bride from head to foot with a superb chain of similes. I want to read this to you. It's a little long, but look at chapter 4, verse 1. This is, this is how he woos her. Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. This will not communicate to us, by the way. I want, what I want you to think as we read this is not, how are, how are our eyes like dust? But what would I say? What, what would be my equivalent today? Your eyes are doves behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats. You know, it's... Got to use your imagination there. Uh, leaping down the slopes of Gilead, your teeth are like a flock of shorn ewes, little little uh, baby sheep, little female sheep, that have come up from the washing, all of which bear twins. And not among them, not one among them has lost its young. Your lips are like a scarlet thread. Your mouth is lovely. Your cheeks are like halves of a pomegranate behind your veil. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built in rows of stone. If you saw the picture a while ago, they had sort of a brick tower for the neck, right? On it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. Your two breasts are like two fawns. And there's very plain spokenness in this, uh, in this book. When we were, again, this weekend when we were studying with, with Gloria, uh, my own um, cultural sense of decency was challenged a few times when she was describing life in Haiti. Uh, she said, I don't want to be indelicate here, but she said at one point, these, in Haiti, these things are just to give milk to a baby. Well, our culture has made something very different out of them. It's, and so I, as I was, Karen and I were talking a little bit last night, it seems like our, cultural, our culture sexualizes everything in a bad way, all right? What you're going to read in the Song of Solomon is, a, is, is, the, is the heightening of sexuality in a very good way. And so he's describing her. They're like two baby deer, twins of a gazelle that graze among the lilies. Until the day breathes and the shadows flee, I will go away to the mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense. You're altogether beautiful, my love. There is no flaw in you. It's a great thing to say to a woman. You're flawless. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. Come with me from Lebanon. Depart from the peak of Amana, from the peak of Sinir and Hermon, from the dens of lions, from the mountains of lepers. You've captivated my heart, my sister, my bride. Notice the nature of the relationship. That is, she is his love, and they have a relationship that, that, that he regards her as a sister in a very good and healthy way. You've captivated my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils and any spice. They've, they've exchanged these perspectives with one another here. Your lips drip nectar, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. A garden locked is my sister, my bride. This is a, this is a reference to her chastity, to her, to her moral 
purity as she comes to, uh, to marriage. A spring locked, a fountain sealed. Your shoots are an orchard of pomegranates with all choicest fruits, henna and nard, nard, saffron, columnus, and cinnamon. With all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, with all choice spices, a garden fountain, a well of living water, and flowing streams from Lebanon. Awake, O north wind, and come south wind. Blow upon my garden, let its spices flow. Now he speaks of her and her chastity. Now he calls it his in, in terms of the really. Paul says that. Don't you know that you're not your own? Your body does not belong to you. Your husband's body belongs to the wife. The wife's body belongs to the husband. And, and this is a principle drawn directly out of the Song of Songs. Let its spices flow. And we could keep on, uh, let, let my beloved come to his garden and eat its choicest fruits. In other words, she says, basically, come ravish me. And then he says, I came to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gathered my myrrh with my spice. I ate my honeycomb with my honey. I drank my wine. Now, I want you to see how the emphasis, as he's early on in this, he's talking about her, your, her, your. Now, now the, that they're married, it's, it's mine. We share it, okay? I want you to see that. Uh, we'll look on to the broadening of love. Um, chapter 5, 2 to 8, 14. She has a troubled dream, uh, chapter 5, verse 2. Uh, and so we talked about that already. Let's, let's move on. Uh, chapter 8, verse 10, she remains a virtuous woman. Look at... I was a wall, and my breasts were like towers. Then I was in his eyes as one who finds peace. She's, she's committed to a monogamous relationship, and she talks about how she came to the relationship. Then this song concludes, we heard it in the video, uh, with, a, with an invitation of, of lover and beloved. Look at verse 13 and 14 of chapter 8. O oh, you who dwell in the gardens with companions listening for your voice, let me hear it. Make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. In other words, come and delight. Now as far as the, uh, the title of this goes, as we've done in the past, uh, we'll give you some titles in a minute. Uh, the challenge you have in interpreting this is, is it allegory or is it history? And I really think the answer is yes. It's, a, it's, it's historical in terms of its, its actual truthful narrative of how God has ordained uh, his divinely prescribed love. Look at Hosea 2, 19 and 20. There's this the reason I'm bringing you here is there's some people who say this is strictly, strictly allegorical, but this kind of allegory comes up all through the scriptures. I want to give you an example. Chapter 2, verse 19 and 20 of Hosea. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. There is a powerful example of God saying how he treats his people. I, I, I'm going to lay my claim on you. I betrothed you. When, in the Old Testament, when you were betrothed, uh, you were essentially married, simply waiting for the married day and keeping yourself chaste and pure for that day. Uh, so there's this, there's this notion that, that the only way you understand this is to think of it allegorically. I, I don't accept that, and we'll look at that in a minute. Hebrew titles, though. Let's look at the titles. The Hebrew title is Shir Hasharim. And it takes us literally out of, the, out, of the, uh, out of the chapter 1, verse 1, the song of songs, the greatest song, the most exquisite song. The Greek title is, is, uh, is very similar as is the Latin title. The Greek title is, is Asma, Asmatan. In other words, what you're seeing there is a statement, song, genitive of songs. Latin, same thing, canticum, canticorum, song of songs, or the best song. And you may have seen, when you're doing some reading, or you may have seen a reference to Canticles 3, 5 or something. You ever come across that in your studies? What it's talking about is the Song of Solomon or the Song of Songs, chapter 3, verse 5. And so the author, I believe, is, is uh, Solomon. Um, and we'll look at some verses here to, to show it. The internal evidence uh, strongly favors Solomon as the author. His name comes up seven times. We'll just read these real quickly. Chapter 1, verse 1, it opens the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. The uh, translation that our Bible project was using, which is of 
Solomon, which is Solomon's, I think, is a better rendering. Chapter 1, verse 5, I'm very dark, but, uh, but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. She cites him here. Chapter 3, verse 7, Behold, it is, the, it is the litter of Solomon. Around it are 60 mighty men, some of the mighty men of Israel. There's this description in terms of the middle of the procession. Chapter 3, verse 9, King Solomon made himself a carriage from the wood of Lebanon. Chapter 11, I'm oh, chapter 3, verse 11, Go out, O daughters of Zion, and look upon King Solomon with the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, on the day of the gladness of his heart. I, and then we'll give you one more. Uh, chapter 8, verse 11, 12. Solomon had a vineyard. We've already read this. I just want to cite it again. He let out the vineyard to keep her. So, so several times in the, in the body of this work, Solomon is identified. I think he is, uh, he is the author and he is the actor. I don't think you have to wonder who the, uh, who the beloved is in this. Um, he did, 1 Kings eleven three. he did have 700 wives. They were princesses and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. Now, understand the time frame. He didn't start out with, with that, but he had these wives. They were mostly suzerainty treaties. If, if I was a uh, powerful man with an army and you felt like I was a threat to you, then I could do one of two things. I could give you one of my daughters to marry, which would make us related, or I could take one of your daughters in marriage, which would make us related. And ideally, though it wasn't always true historically, ideally, relatives would not go to war against one another. And so Solomon, in all of his dealings, being the wisest man, the richest man, made a lot of these treaties. And if you, if you read through the uh, life of Solomon, yeah, they did. They turned him away from the Lord. It was he did not handle that well. It wasn't wise to do. He had these concubines. Why so many concubines? Again, think like somebody in these oriental settings. Your life is tied to your lineage, all right? You have children to have sons. If you happen to have daughters, they become what? Opportunities for suzerainty treaties. If you have sons, they become for you, think about 300 concubines, uh, they become an army for you. Ideally, though David didn't experience this, ideally an army of loyalists. Absalom is an anomaly. Ideally your sons would be an army of loyalists. You could count on them to defend you and protect you and support you. And so that's not a satisfactory explanation no doubt Solomon lost his way, but that's the thinking going on then. We have to recognize and grant them uh, thinking in their day. Someone pointed out, and I thought this was interesting, in 1 Kings 4, 32 and 33, that uh, Solomon, in addition to composing 1,005 a, a songs, shows an intimate knowledge of the plant and animal world. In this song alone, he alludes to 21 species of plants, 15 species of animals. And this song alone cites geographical locations from, uh, I'll show you one example, uh, from Tiz Terza to Jerusalem. Look at chapter 6, verse 4. You are beautiful as Terza, my love, lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. Uh, Another interesting fact of this is there's, there are 49 words in the Hebrew that show up in this song that show up nowhere else in the Scripture. It gives you something of a sense of the expansiveness of Solomon's vocabulary. We told you at the beginning of this the date would be around 965 B.C. Uh, look at Song 6-8. Uh, there are 60 queens and 80 concubines and virgins without number, talking about in the, in the harem or the household of Solomon. Hard to justify, not a model to follow, and it cost him dearly toward the end. But this woman seems to have a unique relationship. This is one, now these others are, are, are marriages of convenience, marriages of political power, marriages to, to hold enemies at bay, marriages uh, to, uh, to produce offspring in volumes. This was a, 
This in the, stands in the middle of this as, as what married love, the joy of married love looks like. And when, so when the language comes up, he speaks as if she's the only woman he knows. That's how special this one is. We know, as I said earlier, 1 Kings 11, 4, when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. It's a sad commentary. Now let's, let's delve into the, uh, the theme and the purpose of it. Well, the theme and the purpose is de determined by what you think is the nature of the book. Uh, some believe it's fictional. Uh, and it, it just a, it's a fiction story about Solomon made up of his courtship and marriage to a, to a poor, beautiful girl from the country. I don't think that's accurate. Some say it's allegorical. The primary purpose, this was the Puritans, by the way. In the Puritan era, they, they had a real, a, the Puritan era was a real mixed bag of things. People look back and say, well, don't be a Puritan. The Puritan era was, was a time of great theological advance. The, Ernie Reisinger said one time, said the reformers swept out the church in the Reformation. The Puritans came along and gave it a second sweeping, a purifying of the church. However, all was not well in the Puritan era. We had one of the highest incidents of illegitimate births during uh, the, the Puritan era. So there was, a, there was a, an appearance and a stance and this is not all across the board, it's not every Puritan, body. and then a practice. So the Puritans came out, they were against Christmas, they, they outlawed the celebration of Christmas, so re re reacting to the Catholic nature of a mass for Christ, which is what Christmas is, they outlawed that. They, uh, they outlawed uh, intimate relations on certain days. You were, one of their practices of keeping the Sabbath holy was that you were not supposed to have intimate relations on the Lord's Day. And they believed then, and it carried over even to Jonathan Edwards' time, that if a, if a, person, that a person gave birth on the same day of the week that they conceived. So if a person, a woman gave birth on Sunday, it was scandalous. They thought, well, what were you doing on Sunday nine months ago that you shouldn't have been doing? I thought we made this plain. It, that's the mentality of, of the day they grew up in. So, so the Puritans treated this strictly as allegory. You, you'll read commentator after commentator during that era, and it's going to be if it's about, it's about Christ and the church and, and the love, and it has, in their mind it had nothing to do with physical, marital love. So that's the allegorical position. Uh, but, the, but the historical position, I think, is the accurate one. It's a record of, of an actual romance uh, with a Shulamite woman. Uh, the joys of love. It has its heartaches, but it celebrates, by and large, the language, by and large, of it is the joys of married love. I, I encourage couples, when I'm, when I'm doing premarital counseling, I encourage them to read the Song of Solomon together. Uh, there's a couple of excellent commentaries, one by a fellow named, uh, his last name is Darrow, uh, where he's very honest about the, the meaning of the language, the imagery being used here. And I encourage them to read that so that they, so that they don't uh, bring an unhealthy attitude into the relationship that, uh, whether, believe it or not, there are churches that teach or don't teach or whatever in such a way that when someone is married, I remember counseling somebody who was traumatized because they've been taught that, that sex was basically wrong. Well, intimate relationships outside of marriage is absolutely wrong. We were looking at that on Sunday mornings. Uh, could we do it again next Sunday? But within the bounds of marriage, it is to be celebrated and rejoiced in. The two becoming one flesh, that's God's idea within the bounds of marriage. So we, we believe that it's a, that it's a historical uh, accurate description, God's ideal, he sets a standard he sets, and basically says to young couples who come and are, and are married under God, enjoy. Go for it. And I think that the church that we have done a, uh, I saw a sign years ago, billboard years ago in South Louisiana, it said, if you are not teaching your children about sex, who is? Because somebody is. Somebody is. 
And we live in such a sexualized world now. The access to things is just, it's, it's breathtaking. It's overwhelming what our children can access. We have, we've got to be the ones on the front line teaching them the, the joys of biblically or divinely prescribed love. So let's look just real quickly at, at some exhortations uh, where God is, is, this is, someone said the Song of Solomon is God's guide to a pure sexual relationship between a husband and a wife. Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. In chapter 2, verse 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. It's <clears throat> the holding fast of the wife is not smothering her so she doesn't get away. It's the clinging, it's the embrace, taking his wife into his life. Experiencing what the, what the video called earlier, this inner desire to know and be known. It's in all of us. 1 Corinthians 6, 16 to 20, we'll be, we'll be looking at this next week. Do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it's written, two shall become one flesh. So the, Paul is citing the Genesis account of God's uh, divinely prescribed approach to relationships. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. Think about this. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body because he or she is involved in something that is designed that by the devil to ruin our souls. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You're not your own. You were bought with a price. Glorify God in your body. The Song of Solomon is a bold and positive endorsement by God of marital love in all its physical and emotional beauty. It has spiritual pictures, spiritual illustrations. We do learn. We, we can read in this and see, that's how my Savior loves me. That's how I need to love Him. It does illustrate God's love for His covenant people. Now, keys real quickly. It wouldn't surprise you, the key word here is love. Love. Biblical love. Now, let me, there's a distinction. What, what most people talk about today as love is lust. It's lust. It's, it's just carnal desire that some are not willing to battle. Carnal desire that you battle with. Love, love includes desire but it's harnessed, it's focused, it's committed. You read 1 Corinthians 13, and it tells you what love is, what love does and doesn't do. It doesn't tell you what love feels like. Love is a commitment. And in that commitment, divinely prescribed by God, it is filled with joy and excitement and fulfillment of pleasure. The key verses we read earlier, I'm my beloved's and his desires for me. The idea that, that if one, a person were to give it all of the wealth of his house, if it were, were to be offered that and take that in exchange for love, he would be despised. It's hard to nail down a key chapter very honestly because this is a, this is a drama. It's kind of woven. It's got movements. And so I, I, I didn't assign that. But what about, where do we see Jesus in the Song of Solomon? Well, I think you've, we've already implied in some of the things we've talked about. In the Old Testament, Israel is regarded as the bride of Yahweh. I'm just going to, let's just touch some things real quickly. I don't want to spend a lot of time here because this is Old Testament passages. Look at Isaiah 54, 5 and 6. Your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. The God of the whole earth he is called. The Lord has called you like a wife, deserted and grieved in spirit, like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. Jeremiah 2, 2. Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem, thus says the Lord, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not so. Ezekiel 16, 
8 to 14. We won't go through all of this, but when I passed by you again, this is the Lord speaking of his people, and saw you, behold, you were at the age of love. And I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord God. And you became mine. I bathed with you with water, washed off your blood from your, you and anointed it to, opens up, he saw her in a field, lying, lying in a field, bloodied and beaten. I clothed you also with embroidered cloth, shod you with fine leather, wrapped you in fine linen. It just says, I adorned you, put a ring on your nose. We wouldn't necessarily go there, but that's, that's the imagery, uh, so on and so forth. So you see that, this idea of God as a husband to Israel. Hosea 2, we read this earlier, 16 to 20, on that day, declares, Lord, you will call me my husband, and no longer will I call, will you call me my Baal. In other words, when you turn back to me, quit chasing after other gods, which, by the way, the Scripture calls a whoring after false gods because of the relationship God has with his people. So uh, there's this powerful picture. In the New Testament now, the church is seen as the bride of Christ. Let's just look at this real quickly. 2 Corinthians 11, 2, I feel a divine jealousy for you, Paul says, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Paul says, I, I was a matchmaker for you. And I, I, made, I brought you into a relationship by grace through faith with one husband. And what are you doing? Ephesians 5, 23 to 20, we've already talked about this. Husband's the head of the wife, is Christ the head of the church? He describes that. Now if the church submits to Christ, so should the wives be submit and everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. So you, you have this imagery. Now let's move on to the book of Revelation. Chapter 19, verse 7 to 9. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. That's the, the consummation of the age is called. And his bride has made herself ready. That's the church. It was granted her to clothe herself in fine, with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteousness, righteous deeds of the saints. The angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then chapter 21, verse 9, then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. So you have this, this imagery and, and because it is so, pops up so much in the Old Testament and so uh, true in the New Someone has said this, that the, the Song of Solomon illustrates the former, the Old Testament descriptives, and anticipates the latter, all right? Well, what contribution has it made to the Bible? Well, it's a different kind of, uh, it's, it's poetic, but it's, a, it's even a different form. It's a dramatic poem. It's a, built on a dialogue between two, two uh, characters and an outside group of chorus throughout it. Makes it a unique biblical book when you look at the, the style, the imagery, the expression. This is but one book, in fairness now, that was spoken against. It's, there's, a, there's a term called the antilegomena. Uh, the, uh, the anti, -legomena, the anti meaning against, uh, logo meaning the, against this word, where they said, we just don't think the Song of Solomon should be in the canon of Scripture. Uh, there were different things. It was delayed because of questions over its religious value. The use of God's name only occurs once in chapter 8, verse 6. The unusual subject matter, because they understood it when the canon was being, they knew, they knew exactly what it was saying. And the lack of quotations from the Song of Solomon in the rest of Scripture, particularly the New Testament. But it's traditionally, historically read uh, at the Feast of the Passover. When, when you celebrate the sacrifice of the lamb on behalf of his people. So that's kind of an overview. And I think if you read it with, with gospel lenses, that you will see God saying, I looked upon Adam, upon Adam when I made him and Eve when I brought her out of Adam. And I said, this is really good. And it's, it's a commendation to, in the, in the proper bounds, experience the fullness of God in marital relationships and don't let anybody rob you of that from whatever your background is. 
Some people were raised in very uh, sexually licentious settings. And that can ruin one's perspective when they come into marriage. Some were raised from very, uh, I, don't, I like to defend the Puritans. I don't like to be speaking about what I call very puritanical settings where you just, uh, uh, we've read to you before when we were going through marriage relationships, a, a letter that, uh, that occurred, came out in a magazine in the 1920s. And it, uh, it's, it's hysterical, but it's tragic. Where, where an elderly woman, an older woman is counseling a young woman how to brace for the, the wedding night. And then she talked about the marriage. Give seldom, give begrudgingly. Go to sleep as quickly as I'm just It's awful. You read and go, oh, my soul. And that, was, that was the mentality. So if you're coming out of a climate like that, coming out of a situation where, where sexual intimacy was never talked about, this book has a, has a great capacity under God to uh, open up your eyes within the bounds and give you a, a very different, a very healthy look at sexual intimacy. Like I said earlier, I encourage all couples I'm counseling primarily, and even some I'm counseling maritally who are struggling in their marriage to, as, as Chuck Swindoll said in one of, one of his books, strike the original match. To go back and let, let this true word breathe over you to, to rekindle and recover and release you to experience all God has for you in marriage. Questions? Comments?